Imagine this. You just got to a new town, sold at your waist, broke and hungry for adventure. You get to a notice board and there, stuck with a dagger, is a message from the palace itself. A mission to aid the kingdom. You go diligently to the doors of the castle and enter the throne room. There, sitting with a majestic look, is the king looking down at you. I have a mission to give you, he says. Sounds familiar? Well, I don't think this scenario is very realistic, even in fantasy. You're not seeing the king today. We all have come across this trope every now and then in the world of gaming, cartoons, novels, etc. I guess we have been educated to expect this from the moment we heard our first fairy tales. Rescue the princess, get title and land, and sometimes even marry the girl and become royalty yourself. I always found this overly simplistic, but for some things it worked. The thing that always made me scratch my head the most was, how can the king sit there all day listening to nonsense and still remain sane? Or, that throne doesn't look particularly comfortable to be doing that all day. The typical king in fantasy tends to represent an absolutist monarch with unlimited power and ample riches, with lands stretching even past the horizon. It is a notion that has served as well for a long time, but now we are a little bit more aware of how these things work. Also, let me clarify that when I say king, I mean monarch. It can be a queen or an emperor, an empress. I'm just saying king for brevity and because it is what inspired this video and this Nick crown. A bit of history. Kings were the regents of, well, you know, kingdoms. A kingdom is a pre-established piece of land with borders that would neighbor other lands ruled by other people. These borders would change sometimes by merging with each other by sword or marriage. From the beginning of time, there was always the Kahuna, the Jarl, the leader of the bunch, the boss. And as conquering adjacent regions kept happening, that title kept growing. I guess you could call yourself master of the universe if you wanted until challenged by a bigger force, and then they will have your title, lands, riches, resources, and whatever was left of your subjects. Also, a king or queen would always be at risk of being invaded, incarcerated, assassinated, and many more things. Seemed to be an enviable position, but like in the tale of Damocles, it is still a really hard position to be in. Here are some types of kings. You have kings that have been glorified as part of a legend, like King Arthur. Rivers of ink have been spilled building his legend over the ages, changing with the contemporary zeitgeist of his contributors over the centuries. We have the strong, just and fair king, whose ruling made the land and his subjects prosper. You have villainous paranoid kings in literature, such as King Macbeth, having his mind warped by the weird sisters and fulfilling his prophecy by trying to avoid his fate and committing the most heinous acts to do so. We have amazing queens of recent years, much beloved and forming part of the very DNA of a nation. And my favorite king of all, King Ludwig II of Bavaria, or what I like to call him, the first nurse recorded in history. Seriously, check him out. Spent his life building castles and palaces. This Disney looking castle, when Disney was good, this is, okay, I'm going to try to say the name so my German friends can either mock me or kill me. I don't really care which near Schwanstein. So yeah, this was built by him. He would have been addicted to Minecraft, I'm telling you. He only had one true friend, Richard Wagner, and even built a palace just to listen to his music. He also didn't like people very much, sleeping all day and reading fantasy tales all night. His castle halls are painted with frescoes about battles and knights in shiny armor, rescuing damsels and even the old dragon here and there. I've been there, it's sick. I guess at the time they didn't have any posters of Jaina Proudmoore or anything Dark Souls related. But if they did, I'm pretty sure he would have them there too. He even had a contraption so his food would be delivered to his bedroom without having to see the servants. I can imagine he would have been having takeaway nowadays. Without servants, I think his room would have been looking similar to Asmon Gold's, but with a gazillion mirrors to reflect all the empty takeaway cups. Sorry Asmon, not an attack, my living room sometimes looks the same. But my place is not as popular, so the joke doesn't work. Also, spent most of his life single. I guess the guy was extra weird. But I don't know about you. Most of my audience seems to be gamers. We are renowned for being weird already. Whether you subscribe to the notion that being weird is best or not. Talking about subscribing, there is a button underneath the video. You can press it. It just takes a second. Just go on. Just, just press. 
So in reality, if you can call reality something in fantasy, an adventurer would rarely get to see the king at the beginning of a quest, save several scenarios. Let's explore them. We have the undercover monarch. Some monarchs would need the help of adventurers, but completely incognito, for very personal matters. Discretion would be paramount, and any rewards would be completely off the books. Kings and queens are sometimes besieged by public opinion and criticism, sometimes coming from the subjects at large, sometimes from the nobility, or even their siblings, which often would also be contending for the throne. If the monarch has a secret issue that shouldn't come to light, they would require no official contact with those who will assist in this endeavor. The adventurers would be wise to keep an eye on these machinations. You know what I mean? The exiled monarch. Sometimes a monarch has to run away from their land to fight another day. This is to avoid having their head chopped off or to avoid getting married to the wrong person. In any case, the king or queen in question does not lose their title unless they have to fake their death. In A Song of Ice and Fire, Viserys is the main aspirant to the Targaryen throne, but cannot go back to Westeros without an army. This is why he sells his sister Daenerys in marriage to Khal Drogo. Again, both Viserys and Daenerys are easier to contact while in exile by commoners than once Daenerys takes the throne, first as a Khaleesi and after as a queen. The mystically inspired monarch. This is a case when a monarch has some sort of divine guidance, a prophecy or other means to have their hand guided in the direction of the characters. In the game of Livion, Uriel Septim VII is running from an assassination attempt when he sees the main character in a cell. He says that he had dreamt of them, but it is, in this case, a matter of chance that the secret tunnel out of the Imperial Palace had its entrance at the precise cell where our protagonist is imprisoned. I like to believe that coincidence was also there by the hand of fate. Since we're talking about cells, the imprisoned monarch. Some monarchs don't need the title of king to accept similar power. In 1431, or around that time, depending on sources, Vlad Dracula was born in Sigishwara, Transylvania. My Romanian friends are gonna kill me for this and he held the title of Prince of Wallachia. Of course, the King of Hungary had power over him, but for the most part he ruled fiercely, protecting his lands and, as a consequence, the rest of Europe against the Ottoman Empire's invasions. He spent a large portion of his life as a prisoner, first of the Turkish and after of the King of Hungary. Sorry if I feel a little bit excited about these facts, but I'm a big fanboy of Vlad Tepes. I can imagine that many people met Vlad in prison. Maybe some of those who shared a cell with him ended up as his service sooner or later, if they survived. But I don't believe this is documented. And if it is, I'm sure it's highly debated. The Nefarious Monarch King Macbeth hires some cutthroats to kill his loyal friend Banquo and his son for him. Because this was a nefarious goal, he needs to do so in secret, and some cutthroats are led into his chamber through a hidden tunnel. In this case, he will be looking at these interactions through the eyes of the bandits. The difference with the undercover monarch is that they are led directly into the palace in secret rather than have the monarch contact them outside under disguise. The Oblivious Heir In the John Boorman 1981 movie Excalibur, Arthur, at the beginning, is completely oblivious to the fact that he is the son of Uther Pendragon. Yes, I decided to quote the movie rather than the legend because I didn't want to open a can of worms. I didn't intend for a battle in the comment section about Mallory or Roman the Brute saying this as opposed to that, you know. In the game Oblivion, you have to get in touch with a lost son of Uriel Septim, who lives his days in a monastery as a cleric. In A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, Gendry doesn't know that he is the son of Robert Baratheon, and Jon Snow doesn't know he's the heir of the Targaryen throne. Meeting these characters is a lot easier before they sit on the throne. Why I don't think a monarch would not be that easy to reach otherwise? If you think about it, a king is normally busy with matters of state when they are working, approving edicts and passing laws. Unlike in the Bible with King Solomon, in the story about the two squabbling ladies about who was the mother of a child, they don't hold receptions for the common folk unless their constituency is very small. A king would spend their time, in the words of Robert Baratheon, drinking and whoring into an early grave. Eating, riding, and hunting would also be very common pastimes. Only certain regions, such as Marcus Aurelius, Emperor Claudius, Alfonso X of Castile, or the already mentioned King Ludwig II, among a few, 
would spend their time reading. Whatever way you look at it, a bunch of dusty adventurers would not meet a monarch just by dropping by the palace, even if their mission is sanctioned by royal decree. Only those with a bit of renown would be addressed personally by royalty. In Critical Role's The Legend of Vox Machina, this is half addressed. On one hand, you have the adventurers show up, note in hand, asking to meet King Uriel. Lots of King Uriels. Who is surrounded by his officials. As Serphine says, paraphrasing, Your Majesty, this is why I advised against putting the notes out. The rabble will come to the palace. And why is this a pet peeve of mine? Because like I said, if you don't meet the Seneschal or some other administrative member of staff in court, you're representing a very small constituency, ergo also a very small kingdom. It works for fairy tales because they are a lot more to the point, but when building a fantasy world, it makes everything shrink in scale. Of course, you can decide to skip these and do what you want. Hell, you can have your princess rescued by an Italian plumber. I'm just a middle-aged dude with a lot of opinions. I'm just saying that if the palace has more than one access point to the power structure, it makes plot points almost right themselves. Also, think about the adjacent towns to the capital. They can have their own appointed officials too, being nobles or simply administrative staff or a highly ranked military representative. Really, really small towns who have a mayor, appointed chief, or even an elder. As long as there's someone in charge, it doesn't matter. Besides, siding with a king is not necessarily the wisest of moves. You can get the mission, get it done, and by the time you get back, three more kings have sat on the bloody cushioned throne. It is not as widely known as it should, but in the movie Conan the Barbarian, after King Osric tells Conan, Subotai and Valeria to go and rescue his daughter from Talsa Doom, he gets himself killed. I know in the official ending they went for, and they returned the wayward daughter to King Osric. But there is a scene in extended footage of Mac von Sido getting stabbed in the throne room. Kings get themselves killed all the time. You're a king and you refuse your daughter in marriage. You get invaded and killed. Your kingdom is not as military strong as your neighbors. You get invaded and killed. Your wife wants to marry someone else. You get poisoned and killed. Your brothers don't have a strong claim to the throne but want to sit there anyway. You get assassinated and killed. Your constituency is not happy with the way you rule. There is a riot and you get thrown in a cell and then killed. Your nobles think someone else would be more advantageous to their treasury. You get poisoned, then stabbed, then hanged, then thrown down a cliff, then tossed in front of a tractor, piloted by a dog, then an R2-D2 falls on top of you, and you're killed. Your world does not have to feel like King's Quest, and that's not a diss on those games, despite Cedric. There are charming video game adventure series by Roberta Williams. If you ever heard the term Moon Logic, that's where it comes from. We owe a lot to this early instances in video game history. If you want to check it out more, check Pushing Up Rose's channel. She's amazing and does a great job. Lots of heart there. Link in the description. And I know there's always room for short format storytelling. In Spanish, we have the shortest one. It says, Érase una vez un rey que tenía tres hijas. Las metió en tres botijas y las tapó con pez. ¿Quieres que te lo cuente otra vez? Of course, the story is stupid, but it rhymes. For the kids, you know. After all, we needed kings for little girls to dream of being princesses. Hopefully not trapped inside pottery, though. I don't like using the term dated or this should reflect the current day. I can't stand this. I guess it depends on where you aim. I suppose back in the day, when it comes to nuance, the most that people expected in the case of video game media, novels, etc. was different than now. Currently, we have more choices, and I would like to offer a perspective that will help to get a bigger picture when it comes to storytelling. Either way, I'm just a middle-aged dude with an opinion and a crown. More to come. Thank you for watching, and see you soon. Oh, and subscribe! Subscribe!